That concludes general questions. Before we move to First Minister's questions, I have agreed to allow the First Minister to give a brief update on COVID-19. At my request, the First Minister wrote to party leaders to provide details of the update as far as possible in advance so that members would have the opportunity to consider that and ask questions. And I am going to extend this session to facilitate this. First Minister. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Presiding Officer. Before I do update Parliament on COVID protections in schools, can I firstly, though, take this opportunity to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen following the 70th anniversary of her accession. Uh, becoming the first monarch to celebrate a platinum jubilee represents a unique and remarkable uh, record of service. Uh, Presiding officer. In recent weeks, and of course as recently as Tuesday, I have committed to keeping Parliament and school communities updated on COVID protections in schools, including the use of face coverings in classrooms. I have been clear that we do not want to keep these or any other measures in place for longer than necessary, but that we must continue to be led by scientific and expert advice and put the safety of our young people first. On Tuesday, the advisory subgroup on education met to discuss a number of issues, including the use of face coverings. Uh, the group reiterated its previous position that the removal of mitigations in schools should be phased. It also advised that the next step of the phased approach could begin after the February half-term break, starting with the removal of the requirement to wear face coverings in the classroom. Uh, the subgroup has advised that this change should apply to both pupils and staff in classrooms and take effect from the 28th of February, when all schools will have returned from the half-term break. Uh, this change will reduce barriers to communication in the classroom and reduce any well-being impacts which arise from the use of face coverings, for example, through their use in support learning and teaching. Of course, and this is a point I want to stress, presiding officer, any young person or staff member who wishes to still wear a face covering in the classroom should be fully supported in doing so. Uh, we currently expect that face coverings will still be required outside the classroom in indoor communal areas of schools uh, for a period after the 28th of February, but this will be kept under regular review. In arriving at its recommendation, the advisory subgroup pointed to reducing case rates for secondary aged pupils, which is a, a recent development, uh, falling hospitalisation rates across all age categories, and the fact that at this stage the estimated R rate is now below 1. In addition, of course, vaccination rates for young people continue to increase. In recognition of this encouraging situation, the subgroup also advised that the remaining restrictions on school assemblies uh, should be lifted and that school visits linked to transitions, for example, primary seven children visiting a new secondary school, should be given greater priority. Uh, these changes were all discussed with the COVID Education Recovery Group this morning. Our guidance will be updated next week, but I wanted to confirm this uh, decision today in order to give children and young people, their families and school staff certainty about the forthcoming changes before the February break. They represent a further step in allowing children and young people return to a more normal experience in school after many, many months of sacrifice. And I hope they will be welcomed, not just across the chamber, but more importantly, across the country. Thank you. And I move to question number one, Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And like the First Minister, I want to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen and her incredible service over the last 70 years. I, I was in the chamber yesterday when my colleague Stephen Kerr led a debate uh, on this subject, and I was pleased almost every member uh, participating in that debate was able to recognise the incredible service of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, in terms of the statement we have just heard from the uh, First Minister, Scottish Conservatives have urged for weeks that young people should no longer be forced to wear face coverings in classrooms for seven hours a day. Young people's education has been unnecessarily disrupted for far too long. Finally, after weeks of refusing to budge, the Government has U-turned. And while it is welcome, it has taken far much longer Absolutely. than was necessary. Absolutely. Uh, but today I want to ask about another pressing issue. Earlier this week, ScotRail confirmed that they are going ahead with planned cuts to 250 services across Scotland from May of this year. In April, the SNP government take charge of Scotland's railways. So will the First Minister commit today to cancelling those cuts? First Minister. Uh, firstly, uh, Presiding Officer, can I say in uh, response to Douglas Ross's comments about uh, my statement a few moments ago, uh, the fact that he has been urging this change for weeks is not a demonstration that he has been right. It is a demonstration of his deep 
deep irresponsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because had we had we made this change uh, weeks ago, uh, we would have done so in, at a time of soaring infection rates amongst school-age children and put school-age children and indeed uh, those who work with them in schools at greater uh, risk. And of course, secondly, had we done it before today, we would have been acting against expert and scientific advice. It would have been the wrong thing to do. Uh, we are doing it now at the right time and in line with advice. And I think that marks uh, the responsibility of this government in contrast to the irresponsibility of the main opposition. On the issue of ScotRail, firstly, uh, can I welcome uh, the Transport Minister's uh, confirmation yesterday that ScotRail will come into public ownership uh, on the 1st of April, of course, upholding a manifesto commitment of this government, uh, this government that was so overwhelmingly elected uh, just under a year ago. Uh, we will continue to do what ScotRail is already doing, making it sure that we have a railway, we have a railway that is fit for the future. It is the case that travel patterns and the numbers of passengers have changed substantially and significantly in the course of the pandemic, um, and the pattern of rail services needs to reflect that. But we also need to keep that under review. So as we see people begin to go back to the office, although we are still in a period of hybrid working, as, as we see uh, passengers increase on our railways, then we need to ensure uh, that the timetable and the routes uh, that are serviced by ScotRail remain fit for purpose. And uh, this government will take on that responsibility to make sure we have a railway fit for the future uh, and the type of railway and the quality of railway that the public have a right to expect. Dr Shroff. The First Minister welcomed the Transport Minister's statement yesterday. Does she also welcome what the Transport Minister said about these cuts when they were announced in her local area yeah. and said they were not acceptable. I'll be interested to see if the First Minister yeah. Yeah. Uh, agrees with that previous that. comment from her Transport Minister. Uh, and here's the problem. The government says it wants more of the public to use public transport, but it doesn't do enough to improve services or bring down rising ticket prices. What is the use in nationalising services if the SNP are just going to do the exact same as ScotRail? The First Minister has just accepted she's going to continue with the cuts that ScotRail are planning. So, First Minister, if you won't change those cuts that are planned, will you at least guarantee that when the Scottish Government assumes control of ScotRail, not one further service will be cut? First Minister. Well, firstly, let's, let, let's talk in terms of reality rather than the mischaracterisation and misrepresentation that we have just heard. Uh, the timetable, uh, the timetable, and I know Douglas Ross won't want to hear this, but I'm going to persevere in answering the question. Uh, the timetable, which initially proposed to add 100 extra services uh, compared to uh, December 2021, is now adding nearly 150 services oh. following the consultation. From May 2022, uh, ScotRail will operate around 2,150 daily services, uh, providing uh, almost 600,000 seats. But the key point here, presiding officer, is that I'm not sure if Douglas Ross or anybody else uh, across this chamber is suggesting that there shouldn't be changes to ScotRail timetables to reflect changes in passenger usage. We have seen a significant and a substantial change following, uh, the, during the pandemic. Uh, that change, to some extent, will continue after the pandemic. It may revert, it may revert back to more uh, to what uh, services, uh, the usage of services was like before the pandemic, and the timetable needs to adapt to that. Uh, that is uh, the, the sensible and responsible approach to take. And of course, uh, on rail fares, we will continue to take steps to keep rail fares affordable. That is one uh, of, uh, I think, uh, the key benefits of public ownership in the years to come. Uh, and I will end this answer with a reminder that rail fares, on average, of course, are significantly lower already in Scotland than they are where the Conservatives are in power in England. Question, Douglas Ross. The, the First Minister urged me to listen to her answer, which I did, but it had nothing to do with the question I posed to her, because she went on for quite a while and I asked, would she commit to guarantee yeah. that her government won't cut any services going yeah. forward? And there was nothing in that answer. And, and to defend the changes that are coming in May based on what was happening in December 2021, well, we know what was happening in December 2021. The First Minister was warning about the tsunami of cases and urging people not to go out of the house or, or go to work. So it's not really a fair comparison about no. December 2021 Absolutely with right. the situation we're in today. 
All the First Minister is doing, all the First Minister is doing is replacing Scott Rail with SNP Rail. Different owner, same problems. And while public transport services are being cut, her government has turned against drivers as well. She's abandoned plans to improve roads and now she's bringing in the workplace parking tax without any cap on the amount people will be forced to pay. When it was first proposed, organisations like the EIS, the Scottish Police Federation and the Unite Union warned about the costs falling on teachers, police officers, care staff and shift workers. All warnings completely ignored by Nicola Sturgeon and her government. Now this week, the Scottish Retail Consortium has said the workplace parking tax is a recipe for extra cost and complexity. And today, the AA are warning that workers are going to be hit with levies as much as £1,000. First Minister, when people are already on the brink, with bills increasing and the cost of living rising, why is your government in favour of a costly workplace parking tax at the same time? Uh, First, First, First Minister, First Minister um, before you respond, I would just remind colleagues that um, I very much like to hear both questions and responses. Thank First you, Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer. Can I say many people in this country right now are on the brink because of benefit cuts and tax rises being imposed uh, by the Conservative Government at Westminster and because of their complete failure uh, to respond appropriately or accordingly. Uh, let me uh, address the points uh, on uh, ScotRail first of all. Uh, what I guarantee is that when Scottish, uh, the Scottish Government takes ownership of ScotRail, uh, we will operate a timetable uh, that is reflective of the usage of the railways by passengers. That's about the real world running of a railway that is fit for purpose. Um, and secondly, uh, we will continue to ensure uh, that we have affordable uh, rail fares. We'll take action to ensure that rail fares are affordable. And let me just remind Douglas Ross, right now, uh, rail fares are, I think, 20 20% uh, cheaper on average in Scotland than they are across the rest of the UK. So that's a good foundation on which to build, uh, I would suggest. Uh, let me turn to the workplace uh, parking levy uh, and remind Douglas Ross, this gives a discretionary power to local authorities. They don't have to use it if they don't want to or if they don't think it is, uh, in fits their local circumstances. Um, and, of course, I would remind uh, Douglas Ross, uh, it was before he was leader of the Scottish Conservatives, I grant you, but in their uh, last local government manifesto, the Tories uh, said, and I quote, we need to empower councils and give them a renewed sense of meaning and purpose. So we are giving discretionary powers to local authorities, and what do we have? The Scottish Conservatives opposing it and moaning about it. The second point is, this is simply giving local authorities in Scotland a power that local authorities uh, in England have had for a decade and more, uh, which is allowed to local authorities in England by the Conservative government. Not for the first time, there is a deep hypocrisy at the heart of Douglas Ross's question. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, here we are again, all parties, all parties across this chamber are rightly signed up to our climate change objectives, to our net zero ambition uh, and we need to get people out of cars uh, we need to get people onto public transport which is why public ownership of the railways is a good thing which is why free bus travel for under 22s yeah. introduced by this SNP green government is a good thing uh, so we will not just set the targets we'll take the action to help meet those targets and we'll leave Douglas Ross and his colleagues whining as usual on the sidelines Douglas Ross Here's, here's the difference between myself and the First Minister. I do want to empower councils. Yeah. She wants to use them as yeah. a shield. Last yeah. week it was her yeah. shield yeah. about yeah. chopping the bottom off the doors. And this week she's using councils as a shield against her tax rises. And it's going to be councils led yeah. by the SNP and the Labour Party that will introduce these car park levies because I can assure her that Scottish Conservative councils Absolutely. will not. Her government... Her government is anti-driver. Her government is anti-driver. The First Minister doesn't seem to understand that for many people, particularly those living in rural areas, they need their car to get to work. And instead of delivering better public transport to make up for the difference, her government is going to nationalise the railways and make no improvements to the services. 
Just what can people expect from a nationalised railway service from the same government that can't even build a ferry? From the same government that launches ferries with painted on windows and sends ferry contracts <laughs> to Romania instead of Port Glasgow. Yeah, so, cool. First Minister, are trains under your government going to go the same way as ferries have? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, on railways, uh, this is a government that has connected or reconnected more of Scotland uh, to the railways in the last number of years. You know, since 2009, the communities uh, of Alloa, Lawrence Kirk, Armadale, Blackridge, Colger Crooks, Conan Bridge, Shawfair, S Bank, Newton Grange, Gorebridge, Stow, Galashiels, Tweed Bank, Contour have all been reconnected to the railway uh, through the reversal of beaching cuts. In the next three years, in the next three years, presiding officer, Reston, East Linton, Dalcross, Cameron Bridge, Leaven will all follow in being reconnected to the railways. So this government has a record to be proud of and we will build on that record. And going back to the workplace uh, charging issue, uh, listening to Douglas Ross there, it's quite clear uh, what his approach is. He will empower local authorities, if he ever gets the chance, which I would uh, humbly suggest is unlikely. He would empower local authorities only if they then do exactly what he instructs them to do. That is not empowerment. We have given powers to local authorities. It is up to them to judge whether and to what extent to use those in line with their local circumstances. That is empowerment. Uh, we will go on with improving public transport and meeting our net zero targets. That's why people continue to put their trust in this government. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by joining others in paying tribute to Her Majesty the Queen, 70 years of dedicated commitment and service uh, to the public of this country. Um, on face masks, uh, I welcome the developments today, uh, but after almost two years, this will add anxiety for staff uh, and workers in schools as well as for parents, and it makes ventilation and HEPA filters even more crucial in our schools, so we need a credible plan from the government uh, on those issues. Presiding officer, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis. At the same time, energy giants are posting record profits. Shell, £14 billion profit this year. BP, £9.5 billion profits this year. Combined, that's over £44,000 a minute. At the same time, household energy bills are going up by almost £700. We need a windfall tax on energy companies with the money going into people's pockets. And it's unbelievable that SNP and Tory MPs refuse to back it. But they're also failing in this parliament. This SNP government has known that this crisis is coming. But despite months of pleading for action, why are people still waiting for help? First Minister. Firstly, this is uh, quite an incredible line of questioning uh, by Anas Sarwar. It's a serious line of questioning, and I'll come on to the very serious point about the cost of living crisis in a second. Um, he asked me about uh, a windfall levy on oil and gas companies last week. I made clear I have no objection to that. I said again yesterday I do think companies seeing rising profits uh, should make more of a contribution, and it is for the UK government to come forward, I, I think, with proposals on that, but he's asking me about something uh, that, regrettably, I have no power to do. So perhaps rather than Anna Sarwar asking me about things I, I lack the power to do, he should join with me in seeking these powers for this parliament so that we can actually do these things as opposed to just talk about them. Uh, and of course, it is not the case uh, that this government has not been taking action. Uh, we have taken a range of measures to help people in poverty, of course, uh, we have set up the, the child payment. We've recently announced plans to double the child payment. We've taken action to help people with uh, the cost of winter uh, and rising fuel costs already. Uh, and of course, in spite of uh, believing, as we do at the moment, although this is still uh, to be finalised, that the announcements from the Chancellor last week will not deliver any net increase to what we were already expecting to have in the Scottish Government budget, the Finance Secretary will set out further plans uh, this afternoon to help those uh, who are struggling with the rising costs of energy. So we will continue to do everything we can to help. But actually, looking to the future, wouldn't it be better if more of these powers actually lay in the hands of this government in this parliament rather than them being left at Westminster in the hands of Conservative governments? Anna Sarwar. 
Forgive me, Prime Officer, but this is classic SNP. Say one thing, do another. Your MPs had a chance last week to vote for a windfall tax and failed to do so. And I did ask the First Minister about what this government plans to do. Because while the First Minister scrambles to put together a last-minute plan, we set out proposals months ago which could have been helping people right now. And in response to the deepening crisis, we have published plans to support hard-pressed Scots. That includes a UK windfall tax that provides most households with £200 off their bills and a further 815,000 household, 815, households in Scotland £600 off their bills. The First Minister says she will set out plans for Scotland this afternoon. We have already set out detailed plans that would help over half a million of the hardest hit Scots. £400 to people who receive council tax reduction, pension credit, child winter heating assistance or clearance allowance supplement and a top-up to Scottish Welfare Fund, giving councils the ability to award £400 to those not covered by this scheme but also struggling to pay their bills. Will the First Minister support these plans? First Minister. The Finance Secretary will set out additional plans this afternoon. Uh, of course, we will look carefully at any proposals that come from Labour or anybody else, but uh, like most of Labour's proposals, uh, they lack any indication of how the plan should actually be paid for. The Scottish Government has actually got to fund uh, the things that we do. Um, and in terms of what we've already done, so we have already taken significant action. For example, uh, we have provided uh, pandemic support payments uh, to more than uh, half a million households. We've delivered the Scottish Child Payment. We've delivered bridging payments uh, to those for older children. We've uh, continued and increased funding for discretionary housing payments, which of course is how we uh, also mitigate against the Tory bedroom tax, uh, which wouldn't even be there if we had more powers in the hands of this Parliament. We've delivered our £41 million winter support fund to help people heat their homes and meet the rising costs of food. We've continued investment in the Scottish Welfare Fund. We're supporting debt and welfare advice services. So we are taking a range of actions. On the back uh, of the Chancellor's announcements last week, uh, we assumed there would be additional money coming to the Scottish Government. It now doesn't look as if that will be a net increase. But notwithstanding that, uh, we have committed and we stand by the commitment uh, to deliver an additional £290 million worth of support, uh, which would have been the equivalent of the consequentials had they been passed on to us. Um, and the Finance Secretary will set out the detail of that this afternoon, where she will balance uh, helping as many people as possible with getting the support to people as quickly as possible. Uh, and we will continue to do everything that is within our power and our financial resources to help people. Anna Sarwa. We have, we have published a fully costed plan which goes alongside the £290 million figure that the First Minister has just quoted. And we knew this problem was coming, and the Government has just set a £44 billion budget. Why was this not a priority when we knew we were in the midst of a cost of living crisis? Reading officer, we are in the midst of a cost of living crisis, and Scots are being failed by two governments who just don't get it. The Tories cut universal credit, put up national insurance, and write off billions in fraud. The SNP increased water charges, increase rail fares while taxing people to park at work and squander hundreds of millions of public money due to incompetence and mismanagement. And both fail to back a windfall tax on energy companies who are raking in billions while bills go up for millions. We have known about this crisis for months, but yet both governments have failed to support people struggling across the country. First Minister, your answers just aren't good enough. If you really want to help family budgets, will you reverse your decisions to increase rail fares and water charges and back Labour's plan? First Minister. Uh, both rail fares and uh, water charges on average are lower in Scotland than they are elsewhere in the UK. But can we go back to the point about votes in budgets uh, and the use of our budget? It's only a few weeks, of course, since we had the stage one uh, vote on next year's budget in this Parliament. That was a budget that included uh, plans uh, and included uh, the money to double the Scottish child payment, game-changing in helping lift children out of poverty. Uh, Scottish Labour voted against the budget that doubled the Scottish child payment. It will be interesting, it will be interesting to see this afternoon whether Labour vote for or against uh, the budget at its final stage. But if they vote against it or fail to support it, then they will be voting against the doubling of the child payment. Anna Sarwar, Anna, Anna Sarwar, 
And as Sarwar is, is saying to me, presiding officer, that's not how it works. I'm afraid it is how it works. But if you want money for a child payment to lift people out of poverty, you have to vote for it in the budget. It's exactly how it works. We will do everything. The support for people in poverty in Scotland exceeds that uh, in other parts of the UK, including in many respects in Wales, where Labour are in government. We do everything within our powers, everything within our resources to help, and that will continue. But Labour will lack credibility on this issue for as long uh, as they team up with the Tories to keep these vital powers over benefits, over energy, in the hands of Conservatives at Westminster, instead of arguing for these powers to lie here, where we can use them to do more to help the most vulnerable in our society. We will now move to supplementaries, and I call Christine Graham. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, what is your response to the actions of Kurt Zuma, the Premier League uh, footballer for West Ham, who tormented one of his cats for fun, with a video of his actions posted on social media for the entertainment of others? And can she advise the Chamber whether she considers the laws and animal welfare here are sufficiently robust to deal with such horrific actions should they occur here? First Minister. Uh, well, uh, this incident certainly uh, what I know about it, which is the same, uh, I'm sure, as what everybody else knows about it, uh, was absolutely appalling uh, and, and sickening. Um, but in terms of the question about Scotland, we have one of the most robust animal welfare frameworks uh, anywhere in the world, actually, and we continue to strengthen and develop the measures in place to protect animals uh, and enable effective enforcement action. So the Animal Health and Welfare uh, Act 2006 would provide and does provide sufficient powers to take enforcement action in a case like this and indeed to remove animals away from abusive keepers. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, the latest bombshell from Ferguson Marine is that cables on one of the ferries they're allegedly building are too short and will have to be replaced. The First Minister will be familiar with the ferry because it's the one she launched in 2017. Can she say how much extra this will cost and what the delay will be? First Minister. Well, firstly, this is an issue around uh, cabling that was installed by FML contractors in late 2018 and early 2019, uh, prior to the shipyard coming into public ownership. The Government uh, and the Finance Secretary will be working closely with the Yard uh, to ensure that this is rectified uh, as quickly as possibly and as cost-effectively as possibly, and she will, of course, keep Parliament fully updated. Ham Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the situation with Trinity Towers in the Glasgow area and may know that 100 households in my region have been evacuated as a, as a result of risk of this dangerous structure. Despite being advised that the evacuation could last two to three months, my constituents are being told by insurers that because no damage has been done to their homes, then no alternative accommodation is provided. In June 2018, following the Glasgow School of Art fire, the Government made £1,500 of emergency funding available for households displaced and it was matched by Glasgow City Council. So can the First, First Minister, my constituents are anxious and distressed about being removed from their homes and possessions. Will the government take action to ensure that similar support is now provided to them? First Minister. Firstly, this is a, an incredibly difficult situation for uh, residents of Trinity Towers and indeed uh, residents in surrounding buildings who have all been evacuated from uh, their homes and uh, remain out of their homes. I know Co-Cap Stewart, the constituency MSP and indeed Alison Fulis, uh, the constituency MP, have been very involved and will continue to be very involved in supporting uh, their constituents. We will, of course, uh, liaise with and, and continue to liaise with Glasgow City Council and offer any reasonable support that we can to help uh, rectify the situation and get people back into their houses as soon as possible. Question number three, Julian Mackay. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking LGBT History Month. First Minister. The Scottish Government has a very strong commitment to advancing LGBTI equality, inclusion and rights. Uh, we work closely with national LGBTI organisations to protect, promote and improve equality. We also uh, show support for key events such as LGBT Youth Scotland's annual fundraising day, Purple Friday. Uh, we recognise that many people feel under or misrepresented in history, so LGBT History Month provides an opportunity to reinforce the sense of belonging, value and respect that everyone has a right to feel. 
Uh, it is also a time, I think, to reflect on what more we need to do as a society to ensure that Scotland is truly equal and inclusive and a place where everyone feels safe and valued for who they are. Julian Mackay. I thank the First Minister for that answer. LGBT History Month gives, gives us an opportunity to celebrate Scotland's diversity and reflect on historic injustice and persecution. Let's be clear. Scotland is an inclusive nation and our commitment to human rights must not waver. That is why it is so shocking for many that bigotry and damaging practices like conversion therapy still happen in this country. This week it was revealed that crimes against LGBT people have accounted for more than a third of all hate crimes reported to Transport Police in the nine months to January this year. Will the First Minister stand with the LGBT community and condemn these acts of hate crime and outline what more she and her government can do to tackle anti-LGBT discrimination in Scotland? First Minister. Um, I agree uh, very, very strongly with uh, the sentiments and indeed the substance of that question. Uh, I condemn all uh, hate crimes and all forms of hate crime, prejudice and discrimination. Uh, we should never be complacent and we should never assume, and I think this is an important lesson for Scotland and many countries right now at this moment in history, we should never ever assume that progress is not reversible. We have to fight for progress each and every single day. Uh, the Scottish Government, I'm sure everyone in this chamber, stands shoulder to shoulder with the LGDP, LGBTI community um, and indeed condemn any and all hate crime. Uh, later this year, the Scottish Government will work uh, with partners to publish a new hate crime strategy to guide how we tackle hatred and prejudice, uh, including when it is directed towards LGBTI uh, community. We will also work with the Parliament's Equalities Committee to introduce legislation that is as comprehensive as possible within our devolved powers to ban conversion practices uh, by the end of next year. These are harmful discriminatory practices which have no place whatsoever in our society. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I associate myself with the comments of Gillian Mackay and indeed the First Minister as we celebrate LGBT History Month. Access to sport for LGBT plus people has been historically challenging and remains so today due to barriers of stigma and discrimination. Whilst we have made progress on sporting role models globally, we still have a long way to go, with many professional footballers in this country speaking of the barriers that remain to players coming out. Would the First Minister agree with me that the work of organisations like Leap Sports and campaigns such as Stonewall's Rainbow Laces are vital in supporting LGBT plus people to participate in and enjoy watching sport? And what more will the government do to support this important work? First Minister. Um, can I thank Paula Kane for that question? And can I absolutely take the opportunity to support uh, the organisation and campaigns that he has cited? I think they are uh, really important. Uh, there is continuing stigma in our society and in sport and perhaps in some sports in particular, uh, that stigma remains uh, particularly strong. Um, all sports uh, people should be encouraged to be themselves uh, and to be open about them being themselves. Uh, and when they do, it is incumbent on all of us to make sure that we show them uh, full support for that uh, and to stand shoulder to shoulder against any discrimination and stigma. We will continue to work with a range of organisations to look at what more the Scottish Government can do uh, to support this. It's something that I know uh, many of us, and I certainly include myself strongly in this, uh, feel very passionately about. There is still work to do, and the Scottish Government is fully committed uh, to playing our full part. Question number four, Michelle Thompson. To ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with professional footballing authorities regarding the protection of women and girls within football. First Minister. Violence and abuse against women and girls is abhorrent and unacceptable. Uh, football, of course, has a very special place in our society, and that is why it is so vital that football authorities and clubs ensure that they and their players are positive role models for both children and adults across the country. Scottish Government officials have recently discussed these issues with the Scottish FA, who have advised that they have safeguarding policies and guidance in place for players and coaches. Uh, and, of course, Scottish women's football also have comprehensive policies in place. Uh, the Sports Minister will be meeting with the football authorities in the near future to discuss what further steps they could take to support women and girls within the sport more generally. Michelle Thompson. I thank the FM for that answer. Now that Wraith Rovers have withdrawn their offer to David Goodwillie, the immediate media storm has died down. But an issue remains within the footballing environment where two clubs felt it appropriate to offer a job to a proven rapist despite no apology or contrition. Furthermore, claims have been made that no payment was ever made to the victim, Denise Clare. Firstly, given the leadership role that footballers have in our society, 
Does the FM support the concept floated by Val McDermott of an independent regulator that could, for example, undertake a fit and proper person test for footballers? Secondly, what steps can be taken by the Scottish Government to support a change in the misogynistic culture of football, where scoring goals is awarded a higher priority than the safety of women? First Minister. Um, Firstly, I do think Val McDermott's uh, proposal merits further consideration in the interest of full transparency. Val McDermott is a, a friend of mine, but notwithstanding uh, that, I do think uh, she has said many sensible things on this issue. Uh, football clubs have a particular responsibility which reflects their special place within our society. Being a footballer, um, for different reasons, obviously, but I suppose a bit like being a politician, it is not an ordinary uh, job. Uh, people look up to footballers. That's perhaps not always true of politicians, uh, but there is a responsibility on football clubs to make sure that uh, those playing for them are role models for the, the wee boys and the wee girls who do look up to them and see them as, as heroes. And, and that, I think, is an important responsibility. And I think the football authorities uh, perhaps uh, need to reflect on recent events and ask the question about whether current uh, rules and regulations are sufficient. Um, of course, there is a deeper culture within our society, and that is reflected in football. Uh, we need to tackle uh, misogyny. Of course, we have Helena Kennedy uh, right now uh, looking at this issue uh, for the Scottish Government due to report uh, relatively soon, and we will reflect carefully uh, on all of that. Uh, that's a more general uh, response, uh, but it obviously has uh, particular questions for football. Um, I would say one thing. I mean, there has been comment made, including about uh, my comments, that you know, when this particular player signed for Clyde, uh, the same outrage was not expressed. Um, it is the case that I think there are things that went uncommented upon, perhaps, uh, in past years uh, that are now called out, and that is progress. And it shows us uh, that there is less of a tolerance uh, for misogyny, less of a tolerance for violence against women, but it's not yet zero tolerance, and it is zero tolerance we have a responsibility to achieve. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to restore peatland as part of its net zero targets. First Minister. Uh, since 2012, we have funded the restoration of 30,000 hectares of degraded peat. We are committed to significantly increasing this to help meet net zero targets. In 2020, we announced a record funding package of £250 million to support the restoration uh, of 250,000 hectares of degraded peatland by 2030. This commitment is helping grow this new industry. It is supporting a pipeline of multi-year landscape scale restoration projects. It is boosting the confidence of contractors to invest in the people, skills and machinery uh, needed to get this job done. It is attracting private finance into the sector and by supporting green jobs in communities across rural Scotland, it is helping our just transition to net zero. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the First Minister for this answer, but we know that her government's desktop approach to rural areas is failing. Peatland targets for the past four years missed. Emission targets for five key sectors missed. Since 1994, 50% of Scotland's iconic species vanished. Lord Devon says the credibility of the Scottish climate framework is in jeopardy. First Minister, when will your SNP Green Coalition take climate change seriously and produce a robust moorland strategy to save Scotland's iconic species and protect biodiversity, sorry, Ms. Hamilton, rural jobs Ms. Hamilton, and livelihoods? Ms Hamilton, sorry, I could not hear your question. Um, I'm not convinced the First Minister would have been able to hear your question. Would you be good enough to repeat the end of your question, at least? Thank you. First Minister, when will SNP Green Coalition take climate change seriously and produce a robust moorland strategy to save Scotland's iconic species and protect biodiversity, rural jobs and livelihoods? First Minister. I actually beg beggar's belief that a Tory MSP is getting up uh, talking about taking climate change seriously. Uh, clearly they didn't listen to the questioning of their leader uh, at an earlier stage. The the approach of the Conservatives, of course, is to say we should take climate change seriously, but then opportunistically oppose every measure we take to tackle climate change uh, when it suits them to do so. And we saw uh, that very, very clearly earlier on today. This government's record on peatland restoration is a good one. I've already uh, spoken about the restoration of 30,000 hectares, the record funding package, um, and all that that is enabling. So we'll continue to get on with taking the actions to tackle climate change, and perhaps it's the Conservatives who need to learn to take it a bit more seriously. Colette Stevenson. 
Thank you, President Officer. Can the First Minister outline what funding has been made available to the 45 hectares of peatlands at Langlands Moss? And does she agree with me that the work undertaken by the Friends of Langlands Moss has been a huge factor in promoting the local environment and improving people's health? First Minister. Well, in 2019-20, uh, the Scottish Government funded uh, Peatland Restoration Programme funded work at Langlands Moss to the value of £63,800. Uh, I would certainly agree that the Friends of Langlands Moss is an excellent example of the type of partnership needed to allow communities to make decisions about management of their local environment and help address the twin climate and biodiversity crises. Question number six, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to reduce delayed discharge from hospitals in light of reports that it is at the highest recorded level since the COVID-19 pandemic began. First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to reducing the number of people delayed in hospital. In October, the Health Secretary announced an investment of £300 million to help address winter pressures. This included £40 million to support alternative interim care arrangements and £62 million to enhance care at home. Uh, part of this funding is being used to rapidly scale up hospital at home services to firstly uh, and foremost provide uh, better care, but also to help alleviate pressures on acute services. There have been significant recent developments with new services launched in Ayrshire and Arran and Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We have also recently launched the Discharge Without Delay programme, backed by £5 million, to help local health and social care partnerships improve discharge planning arrangements over the longer term. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for her response? We know that by ending delayed discharge, it frees up bed capacity in hospitals, it has a positive effect on A&E waiting times, and it even has a positive effect on ambulances queuing at the front door. The Cabinet Secretary for Health, she's quite right, set out his plan to help the NHS through the anticipated winter crisis. But given the levels of record high levels of delayed discharge. Does the First Minister believe that her Cabinet Secretary's strategy has worked? And why is it that seven years on from the SNP promising to end delayed discharge completely, are there more than 1,600 people unnecessarily stuck in hospital? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do believe the actions that we are taking are the right ones, but we're not complacent and we will continue to take whatever steps we can uh, to address this. In fact, the Health Secretary and I and senior officials have a session just this afternoon uh, to look at progress on this and what further steps we need uh, to take. It is worth uh, noting that the average bed days occupied by delay for 2020-2021 uh, represent uh, a reduction on the, the previous year, a reduction of 34%, but it is still uh, too high. This is a whole system challenge um, and it is one uh, we are very focused on addressing. Um, it takes uh, steps across the whole of the, the health and care system and of course the work to establish a national care service in the longer term is important in this context as well. Question number seven, Martin Whitfield. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether <clears throat> she will provide an update on what steps the Scottish Government is taking to improve CAMS waiting times. First Minister. <clears throat> We know that uh, the pandemic has been exceptionally difficult for the mental health and well-being of many children, young people and families. Uh, we have allocated almost £40 million additional funding in 2021-22 to NHS boards to improve CAMS. That comes from our overall recovery and renewal fund. Uh, more than £4 million of that allocation is directly focused on offering treatment to those already on CAMS waiting lists uh, to tackle the longest waits. Uh, and we're working closely with all NHS boards, particularly those with the most significant challenges, to develop and implement detailed local improvement plans uh, to clear backlogs and meet targets. Martin Whitfield. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer? The Royal College of Psychiatrists themselves this week have called on the Scottish Government to, quote, pull out all the stops and explain how it will meet its target for investing in mental health services for our children and young people. I was contacted by a teacher who is more than happy to meet the First Minister, and this teacher said, could you ask her, can she rescind the free bus travel, stop giving out laptops, and put some money into mental health provision for our young people? What good is a laptop and a free bus pass when you're in a deep state of anxiety and depression? Will the First Minister agree to meet with this teacher to find out what CAMS delays feel like? for those who are left to support our young people through this waiting period. First Minister. Uh, firstly, of course, I or the Health Secretary will be happy to speak to uh, the teacher quoted uh, or indeed any uh, 
professional working uh, with young people. This is a, a really serious issue. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if the member is seriously asking me uh, or just quoting somebody else asking me to rescind uh, free bus travel. I think that would be the wrong thing, yes, the wrong thing to do uh, for the broader uh, well-being of our young people. So perhaps that's something the member could uh, clarify um, at some stage in the future. Um, in terms of uh, the action that we are taking, the NHS recovery plan uh, commits to provide uh, extra funding uh, for more than 300 additional staff in CAMS over uh, the coming years. That has the potential to increase capacity uh, to see cases by over 10,000. Uh, long waits are always unacceptable, but it's important to stress that long waits are not the norm. Uh, the median wait nationally for a first treatment appointment in CAMS uh, was seven uh, weeks and of course almost eight out of ten uh, young people, which is not good enough, but eight out of ten right now of children and young people are seen within the, the target we set. Uh, the final point I would make, Presiding Officer, is that while the investment I am speaking about uh, to tackle longer waits is really important, there is a bigger challenge here, uh, which is to redesign and reform uh, CAM services so that there is more preventative uh, treatment, that there is more early intervention. That is why counsellors in schools are so important the uh, approach to a national wellbeing service and indeed policies uh, like free bus travel uh, which supports the overall wellbeing of young people. Uh, so this is something uh, we need to address on all of these fronts and this government is doing exactly that. Call Ross Greer. Thank you. I acknowledge that today's announcement on face masks in schools was made on the basis of clinical advice, but for many clinically vulnerable staff and pupils in our schools, this will only increase their anxiety. Can I ask the First Minister to confirm that no school or council should seek to prevent any pupil or member staff who wishes to wear a face covering from continuing to do so? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I think this is a really important point, so uh, I'm grateful to Ross Gear for giving me the opportunity to underline it. Um, the requirement to wear face coverings in classrooms will be removed from the end of February. But any young person or indeed any member of staff who feels safer and would prefer to continue to wear a face covering uh, should absolutely be fully supported in doing so. In all of the decisions we are taking right now, it is important that we balance uh, that understandable um, and perfectly legitimate desire uh, to get back to normal with understanding that those who are more clinically vulnerable do have a real sense of anxiety and we need to consider their needs um, and concerns as well. So that's a really important point and I'm glad to have the opportunity to underline and emphasise it. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over 200 nurseries wrote to the First Minister this week to raise concerns relating to the rollout of 1140 hours and the funding and equity between private and voluntary industry and local authority nurseries. Private nurseries have warned that these are serious flaws in the delivery of 1140 hours, and if they are not addressed, many will have to reduce opening hours or close completely. Can I therefore ask if the First Minister will respond immediately to the concerns contained within the letter and if the Scottish Government will commit to an audit on early learning and childcare funding, comparing best value between all sectors? First Minister. Well, firstly, of course, we will uh, respond and, and indeed listen carefully uh, to the views expressed in that communication. But you know, I'm really proud of the fact that since last August, all councils have been offering uh, 1140 hours of funded early learning and childcare to all eligible children and that the private, third and childminding sectors are playing a vital role in the delivery of that and increasing choice and flexibility for parents. And I want to thank everybody across the sector for that. We're investing more than a billion pounds in early learning and childcare in this financial year and it's important to stress that the funding agreement between the Scottish Government and COSLA enables local authorities to pay sustainable rates to private nurseries who provide free early learning and childcare places and to childminders. That's an important principle but of course uh, we will pay close attention to the points made in the letter uh, and respond as quickly as possible. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Ruth Maguire.